So hi everyone and uh, welcome to the last session of the software development and performance track with our next speaker Bhavani Ravi. So uh, Bhavani is a research engineer at Sama Technologies, an open source contributor for Rasa and Pandas. She runs Women Tech Makers Chennai a community for talented women to explore the male-dominated tech world. Outside of development and communities, she is a blogger, bibliophile, artist, and an, and an inspiring uh, entrepreneur. Um, and today, Bhavani will share her knowledge about distributed data pipelines in Python. So please join me and welcome Bhavani. Thanks for the great introduction, Mikey. Uh, hello, everyone. Hope you're all having an exciting, wonderful time at PyCon Sweden conference. And thank you all for being here to attend my talk on distributed data pipelines in Python. And uh, we use Airflow to achieve it. And if you want to connect with me in Twitter, uh, that's my handle, at Geeky Bhavani. Uh, let's get started. Uh, this is primarily me in three points. I currently work as a backend engineer uh, in the research team of Sama Technologies. And we are a team which takes the state of the art machine learning algorithms and apply them to life sciences pharmaceutical domain. And with the boom or bain of uh, COVID, we are in full speed uh, trying to bring the best solutions to the pharmaceutical industry. It, and I also run, I'm, I'm a big community freak. I run Women Tech Makers Chennai, uh, primarily to bring more diversity and inclusion in other communities in Chennai. I'm also an open source enthusiast, uh, contributed to Pandas, Rasa, uh, and exploring Airflow currently. And uh, my all the distributed data pipelining work comes from working at Sama. Uh, like I said, when dealing with Pharma, we kind of work with a lot of data, and that's when uh, all the distribution, distributed data pipelining concepts come into place, right? Uh, to start with a little idea of what uh, distributed data pipelines is and how does it match to the business side of things. Uh, long, long ago, if you have um, worked with ETL systems or when we talk about machine learning models, uh, we should also talk about the data that comes with it. And when you're talking about production level machine learning algorithms, we are totally moving from CSV files and moving towards data lakes and uh, big data. And the transformation in data sources are from a variety of uh, places. And one of the component that we use primarily to achieve this, uh, handling this amount of data is Airflow. And when you talk about long, long ago, when a traditional system or very old systems uh, you start with writing a Python script to automate certain things, and you need one person to run the script every time, right? So business people will be say, let's automate this thing, and some developer will write a script, and that is a particular task that's being automated, and you need that developer in-house to run the script, watch the logs, and see what's happening, just in case if there is a baby or he need to come back and fix it, and things like that and once business saw this working the uh, script is giving enough value they say you know uh, why not we automate it to run at 12 a.m every day any issues that happen during the run we will fix it in the morning so and that started working well as well the developer comes back in the morning and says you know yeah now it's working fine uh, so let's let's go ahead and create business value out of it but man uh, as always we are greedy uh, as humans, we are always greedy, and we need uh, more tasks now, and we need more tasks and running at different schedules. And traditionally, what we are trained to use is cron jobs, and cron jobs with one task is easy to manage and maintain. With multiple tasks, it kind of becomes a little icky, right? And uh, the more and more tasks grow up, the maintenance of it, the tracking of it becomes a huge issue. And once one fine day, the business people will come in and say, you know, uh, what happened to the run that happened on 15th of October uh, at 7 a.m.? And you have to be able to fetch that data at that instance and give it to your business people. 
And there is also a case where uh, task one and three can be interrelated. There, there might be a business requirement that says, you know, uh, finish task one and wait for uh, the task three, uh, wait until task one completes for task three to execute. So these are the best research requirements that keep, com keeps coming up. And they are more slowly moving from tasks to workflows are data pipelines, right? So a simple workflow that uh, I can talk about is, you know, like a conference like this, uh, when a user registers for the conference, you need to send a confirmation email. That can be a very simple one-liner workflow. But imagine a 10,000 people registering for a conference. How are we going to scale it for that uh, huge site of audiences, right? And another very common use case that we are uh, dealing with at Sama when we are building these machine learning mo models is whenever this, there is new data, one, there has to be predictions for the business people to derive value. Another thing is we have to have uh, we have to improve our machine learning model to perform better predictions next time. So one is the training pipeline, another one is the testing pipeline. So here is a sample. Uh, whenever there is a new data in our data lake, uh, to take the data, train the model, test the model, and maybe push it to production. And this is one other another workflow example. Similarly, if there is new data, pre-process it and do some predictions on it and derive insights. And when things like this, have, when you have uh, requirements like this, trust me, business people do not want to wait 21 hours for an ingestion to run. They do not want to sit, uh, want to uh, dedicate a resource to actually run the script every time they need it, and then someone to watch it, someone to track it. Uh, someone to maintain the logs. So that's when uh, we need this pipeline management system, which can create, uh, which gives you an easy handle to create this pipeline of tasks. And at any point, we should be able to see what are we actually processing. And the second thing is we should be able to schedule it at a given interval. And business requirements constantly change, and the schedule should also be uh, easily modifiable. Uh, the third thing is um, business people are completely fine with uh, fine with failures in a system, but when a failure happens, how are we gonna revert back from that? How are we gonna uh, gracefully come out of that failure? Are the, are we gonna send a detailed email report instead of a developer looking through the logs and uh, finding what's what went wrong? Or the system is gonna uh, intelligently figure out what went wrong and send you an email? And another thing is, um, like I said, what happened on the ingestion that happened on 30th October? Or um, it looks like there is a data mismatch between the database and the ingestion. Can you check the logs and see if there is anything missing? So we need one centralized place where we can track all of this. And finally, we need, we need to have a centralized place where we can see the logs of all these runs that we have been doing. And Airflow is one such tool. Uh, it's an open source uh, library uh, maintained by Apache. It makes all of this process very easy for us to handle. And it helps us create workflows, maintain uh, states of the task, you know, uh, maintaining audit logs of all the runs that has happened. And one of the reasons why we use it is Pythonic, since we are all a Python hub. Uh, it's primarily Python, and the distributed part of it is completely uh, cheap using Kubernetes. It has a very fancy UI, and of course, uh, this is a very important point because this is not just for developers. You you also have uh, project owners coming in and looking at what's going on in a pipeline, whether the particular run has happened, whether a particular data has been properly ingested. So the UI makes it very easy for all the stakeholders in the project to come and take a look at what's going on. And last but not least, this is my favorite. Since it's all Python, since it's all uh, a Python class, you can extend it and write your own um, customizations on top of it. There was a talk later uh, earlier today where um, where there were customizations made to Airflow to achieve certain things. So those are some of the best features of Airflow. And how do we do that is we define a directed acyclic graph using the API provided by Airflow. And each task, uh, each node in the in the graph is a task. And this task can be a Python uh, function or a bash script or a Golang script. And it's up to you to decide. Right? So some of the Airflow concepts we will just look at is one, there is task, uh, sorry, one, there is a DAG. 
and the DAG has multiple nodes, the character cyclic graph has multiple nodes, and each node is in itself an operator. It's called an operator in uh, Airflow. And you can run Python uh, functions directly, or you can expose a bash operator. It also provides you a lot of hooks to existing resources like S3 or GCS. And there's also another concept called sensors where uh, you can pull a particular uh, endpoint or a API or a particular uh, status in a uh, DB and then perform a certain operation. And during runtime, what happens is a copy of this task is created, an instance of this task is created, it's called task instance. And that's run independently from the core of the Airflow. So those are the three uh, main names that you should remember, DAG, task, and task instances. And next is, how does Airflow work in an architectural way? It's a glorified cron job uh, to say it in one sentence, but it provides all these additional uh, features, which makes it very easy for us. Uh, one is, it starts with the metadata DB. All the, uh, D, all the DAGs and the tasks are stored in a Postgres or MySQL DB, and it's kind of customizable. And the scheduler, which runs along with Airflow, goes through the metadata DB, looks for the scheduled task, and then uh, creates a task instance and hands it over to the worker. And all these are tracked in a metadata DB for the web server uh, component to display it in the UI. So we'll see more of how the UI looks, how the DAG is designed, and all that uh, in the next slides. So DAG design is another major component that you should be keeping in mind when when we uh, actually think about distributed data pipelines. If it's just data pipeline, what we will have is something like this. Uh, this is just a mocked version of what we have in production. This is not the use case we are solving. This is just a mocked version. Um, so with the US election, we all would have been uh, watching news constantly, switching through the channels. I was doing that. I was going through tweets a lot. And this is a simple idea of you know what happens if I have to go through each Whenever there is a new tweet, I have to fetch the tweet and classify it whether it's based on election or not, whether it's a positive towards the person I'm following or not, something like that. So this is an idea. And at the very basic, it's just a Python script with, which loops through you know, uh, the list of channels, list of profiles I want to track. And you can fetch tweets initially and then reprocess it and then classify tweets. And if you convert that into a data pipeline, it would look like a very simple single pipeline uh, structure, right? So this is a very simple DAG design. This would work perfectly if you are dealing with very small amount of data. Let's say there is like only 10 tweets per uh, profile, then maximum we have like 50, uh, 50 entries, and that would not take you more than a hour uh, to process. Let's say there are like 10,000 tweets coming in every, uh, every hour. Then we are dealing with the scale that we are talking about, and then uh, at that point, we need better orchestration of the stack. Uh, so thinking about the data point where you can run things independently. For example, uh, in my use case, tweets from CNN does not uh, affect the tweets from NBC. Those two are completely independent, so I can run them in parallel. Of course, you can go for uh, the multi-process method of implementing things. But again, as I said, the drill down a view of what's happening when I ingest an NBC data. What happens when I ingest the CNN data? That level of drill down, you kind of lose it in the mess uh, mess of the logging, right? So another better um, DAG design for this structure would look like this. On the left, I have this DAG uh, important from Airflow. And I have a new classifier DAG created. It runs at 12 AM uh, every morning. And on the right, for each uh, profile in in Twitter, I want to track. I will create a fetch task. I'll create a pre-process task. I'll create a classified task. And I'll bring it all together into one glorified DAG. And that would look something like this. So each uh, profile is completely independent. Each running does not impact the other one. And finally, we can accumulate all the uh, status of all the DAGs, all the tasks, and we can send an email. So that's the first concept. Uh, I want to insist when you are doing distribution, uh, you should really be able to divide your data into independent tasks. If you can't do that, then there is no point in distributing the task or the workload into the independent components. So 
like i said uh, you you with airflow you'll be able to track all the changes that has happened all the runs that has happened in the past you would be able to so these are uh, on the right you could see a lot of green and blue dots that's the status of each task in that pipeline uh, over a period of time so you have the time stamp associated with each of them and all of those are the task instances and another requirement that came uh, comes up more often is you know uh, uh, using resources uh, better, right? So, for example, in the in this case of pipeline, uh, checking whether there is new data, checking whether there is a new tweet, does not take a lot of resource. Uh, it's just one API call, right? But fetching data, pulling data from uh, Twitter, might be a lot of I/O load, a lot of API calls, right? And pre -pre uh, doing pre-processing uh, in case of large volumes of data might be a CPU intensive and memory intensive task. And in prediction, you might have a model which runs wonderfully on GPUs and not on CPUs. So you need these customized resources per task. So this is another use case for uh, maximum utilization of all the resources that you have. And this drill down version is another important factor of uh, distributed data pipelines. You should be able to use the resources gracefully. Uh, another important use cases um, you know you might have different teams working and not all of them will push the code to a centralized repository most of the time they would be exposing a docker uh, image to you and say you know i have the script i have all the scripts in here just run this and produce a result for me in that case there's this kubernetes pod operator in uh, in airflow which all it does is it pulls the docker image that's been exposed uh, runs the defined script like in the command and produces the result just like how it runs a python uh, python command so in in terms of teams also it's distributed it doesn't have to be one team uh, corely focusing on what co code goes in inside the dag and stuff like that so that come that brings us to the actual distributed component of airflow with kubernetes so the whole idea is each task will have its own pod to run, thereby making it completely delegate a uh, delegated structure and also distributed. So yes, why do we need Kubernetes? One is the distributed uh, part we talked about. And the second thing is dynamic resource allocation. Each task can have its own uh, amount of CPU and memory defined and scalable. Uh, of course, you can scale it up. If it, it all depends on the amount of resource you're putting in. You can scale the cluster and have multiple nodes, have multiple tasks running. Just in case you have 100 DAGs uh, and you need to scale them up, uh, it's just a matter of running more pods and shrinking them down when you don't need it. Okay? And absolutely, with Kubernetes pod operator, it's language agnostic. And with the Kubernetes uh, structure, um, the architecture still remains the same. The components still remains the same. Uh, but the working is a little different. So the web server and scheduler, of course, uh, the web server and scheduler, of course, goes, goes through the Postgres uh, DB for all the data. Uh, it pulls the Docker image that contains Airflow. And even the worker pods have the Airflow instance in it running. And from the Docker image, uh, it runs the particular task that you have defined and then writes the result to an S3 or a Google bucket. And all these are exposed via Kubernetes service to the outside world. So this is my Docker file, a very simple Docker with Apache uh, Airflow installed in it with a pip install. And I have been using Postgres and Kubernetes for this. And you can copy your DAGs into the uh, DAGs folder in the Airflow directory. And defining an Airflow pod is as simple as uh, Airflow pods configuration, right? So we have an Airflow config uh, mounted. We have uh, an, a DAG folder mounted and the logs folder mounted. And you can define the Docker image in the image tag. So the next thing is, how do you configure your workers? Airflow has a configuration file, which has a ton of configuration setting, which you can on or off. So in this case, you have to specify that you're going to use a Kubernetes cluster, a Kubernetes executor. The second thing you need to verify is, uh, like mention is, what Docker image are we going to use? What is the tag? Uh, how often do you want to pull it? 
whether you have any kind of authentication required to pull the image. So all of this are a configuration file, you just mentioned them. So with that, you will be able to, with this configuration and the DAG design together, you will be able to define, uh, you'll be able to define these uh, data pipelines, which are highly distributed. Again, it's it's not the magic of Airflow doing the distribution. It's, it's all about how you design it. So think about the data points that you want to split your task on. Um, in case of e-commerce, whether it's your customers or whether it's your products. So think about your business use case in mind and delegate and distribute the task as much as, as, much as possible. And since it's all Python objects, you can play around with it and generate tags dynamically. Uh, some of the pain points that we uh, face every day when using Airflow, and these are the pain points. Since it's an open source project, this you don't have to do the blame game. We can go back and contribute to it. Being an open source enthusiast, I'm not associated with Airflow in any point other than being the enthusiast for contributions. Right? So these are some of the places where you can contribute. One is uh, the current documentation with Airflow 1.11.11 uh, 1, 1 .11 is not so, not so ex extensive. So you can obviously uh, contribute a lot in here. And the second thing that we talked about is Airflow has a learning curve. So bear with me for a moment. Airflow, yes. Airflow has a, a learning curve. So as a developer, it might be easy for you to grasp a certain concept. But uh, when you're talking about all the other stakeholders in the team, they can also use Airflow. But it takes a while for them to get up to speed. And it's your responsibility to you know share that knowledge with them. You know, for example, where to look for the logs, what to look in the logs, how do you uh, restart a failed act, things like that. So, of course, even for developers, it has a learning curve, but getting all, all your team on board will actually reduce your work. They're, they're creating a distributed knowledge across the team, not just distributed task. Uh, the third thing is worker pods currently uh, in Airflow is all, um, they have abstracted the Kubernetes objects. So, what happens is you don't get the fine-grained access you want with YAML files. You get with YAML files. So these are all uh, actually changing in the next version. Another important use case that pops up every now and then is uh, the ability to create runtime dynamic. So with Airflow, you can read a database and create DAGs and keep it in memory. But uh, keep it in memory, but uh, you can't create them in runtime. For example, if I am uh, scraping a Twitter profile and I get 100 tweets, I can't delegate all the 100 tweets to 100 worker pods. That is not defined. So DAGs are predefined before execution. So anytime before execution, you can define a DAG and run it, but you can't do it on the fly when the tasks are running. But some of these things, some of these pain points are changing in Airflow 2.0. That's the promise that we're getting. We are getting very uh, low latency, high availability schedulers. And of course, way better documentation and they are providing helm shots and you can define all the worker pods directly from YAML. So there is a lot of hope for Airflow to actually change the way you run your task, everyday task and uh, automating your everyday workflows. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if you want to look at uh, all my Airflow work, you can refer some of my blogs from bhavaniravi.com. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a great talk, Bhavani. It was really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking that uh, I would like to start with uh, checking with the audience. Uh, if anyone in the audience have any questions? If you have any questions, you can just write your questions to Bhavani in the chat to the right. Um, and meanwhile, uh, there might be uh, some sort of delay. I would actually like to ask you a question, Bhavani. Sure. Um, so you talked about um, you know, building a distributed data pipelines using Airflow, Docker, and Kubernetes. And I was just, uh, I'm just curious about what you think is the most challenging part with building 
a data pipeline consistent using those tools? Okay, one of the biggest problem is not the technology itself for me. Uh, sorry for the background noise. It's the biggest celebration of India. Diwali is going on. So that's why you put all the crackers. So bear with me. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. So yeah, because the problem with yeah, the, this setup is not the technology itself, right? Technology comes very handy. But bringing all your people on board, uh, where they are very used to conventional scripting, right? Uh, bringing all of them on board, trying to uh, make them understand what distribution is all about. The centralized, identifying the centralized data point, customizing your code, not with a lot of for loops, but with a lot of hand holding, right? Don't use a lot of for loops. If, every time there is a for loop in your code, there is a possibility that it can be distributed. That's, that's like the mantra. So getting them to think in a way of distributed data pipeline, thinking them, making them think that this script is going to be executed by another system, which is going to distribute and delegate the task. So I don't have to do it. So that ideology, uh, seeding that ideology into the other developers is like the key uh, problem that we had. And we are kind of, as when, when you use it and a lot of code reviews happens, so we kind of got hold of that. A really good answer. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that maybe we could uh, round up here then. And once again, thank you so much, Pavani. Thank you for hosting me. I had so much fun. Yeah.